My name is Leon Bosch, and to most of my colleagues and friends for decades, I've been known as the British double bass player. But the truth, of course, is that I'm South African born. I don't know, I think it's because I was associated with the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields and most British orchestras, and that gave rise to me being referred to as the British bassist. But in any case, my, my journey in life began on the 7th of July, 1961, in South Africa. That was during the terrible times of apartheid. And for those who need reminding, apartheid was a viciously enforced system of racial segregation. It meant that everything was kept separately, that we lived in townships, if you were of color, like I was. And the township into which I was born, Bishop Lavis, otherwise also known as Lavistown, was on the very, very dusty, sandy Cape Flats. The home we lived in, and I use the word advisedly because we turned what is a hovel into a home. It was a brick-built structure with two bedrooms, asbestos roof, wooden doors, with an outside toilet, but a garden big enough to be able to grow vegetables and also to keep chickens and ducks. And I was mostly responsible for looking after those. Also, when we, for dinner on a Sunday afternoon, I used to have to slaughter chicken. But the townships were a vicious place. Life expectancy, if you stepped outside your gate, was pretty low. Murders were rife, robberies, and when people live with no hope, it drives them to desperation. In my street alone, 12th Street, we lived in number 16. A few houses along the way, there were young men who had been sentenced to death for various offenses. The apartheid regime used the death penalty viciously against people of color. And it was a matter of almost shame for those, those families whose kids ended up on death row and eventually hanged. And we sort of knew which families they were, and it was a warning to everybody else of what might happen. But our home was a very loving place. My parents were both from the country. My father was born in a small place called Hanardendel. And for those of you who know, Mandela's country house was named Hanardendel after this beautiful little place in the Overberg Mountains. My mother was from Worcester and she was a school teacher. But my father, in his little town, grew up to become a revolutionary. He discovered that there were certain reasons why South Africans, in general, lived in desperate poverty. And he, with colleagues and friends, decided that they should work to change that. And he was one of the founder members of the New Unity Movement. And the New Unity Movement was so dangerous to the apartheid regime that they persecuted most people involved in it. So my father was often the subject of banning orders and arbitrary detention. My first memories as a child, in fact, are of men in dark suits in my bedroom. And only when I was old enough to know better did I realize that I wasn't dreaming, but that these were special branch policemen. Our house was raided quite often on the pretext that there might be banned literature on our bookshelves, and that would give them an excuse to detain my father. And this is the atmosphere in which I grew up. And we had two bedrooms in the house, four siblings. My brother and I slept head to toe in one bed, and my sisters slept in the other bed head to toe. And that's how we lived. Every morning, we'd open the curtains, and I'd see Table Mountain, the iconic mountain which defines the city. But the suburbs surrounding Table Mountain were completely off limits to people like us. But in any case, my parents were quite progressive. They were members also of the Teachers League of South Africa that had a motto, let us live for our children. They believed that education was the way to liberation, emancipation, and justice. And they endeavored to give us the very best education they possibly could with the meager resources that they commanded. My father believed also that music should form a part of our education. And I don't know how they managed this, but they bought an upright Yamaha piano, they also bought what today seems comical, but a hi-fi system. And my father bought the contents of a music library that was shutting down, 2,000 records. And he borrowed a vehicle to bring them home. And every night after dinner, we would together listen to symphonies, concertos, opera. And there'd be quizzes to find out what we really knew. The bedroom which we shared as siblings, every wall was laden with bookshelves dictionaries, the classics, literature about every revolution possible, the Russian Revolution, the French Revolution, economics, you name it, everything was in that room. 
And I was a voracious reader fairly early on. And that gave me a view of what the world's really like out there. Part of our education was music, as I said, and my father arranged for us to receive lessons, not just at the school where we were, which was in the next township, Matrosfontein, but he eventually discovered that we needed better teaching and he found that the University of Cape Town ran a junior string project. And that's where my real commitment to music began. I used to go to string orchestra, conducted by Noel Travers. There were four orchestras, A, B, C, and D, and I progressed through them all really very quickly. And eventually I ended up in what was called the Archie Ensemble. The Archie Ensemble is a string ensemble, much ahead of his time. And for those of you who are familiar with ensembles like uh, the one where they wanted to that remain in Britain, but the Guildhall strings were one of those, and the Goldberg. I played in this ensemble, and that's where I learned the core repertoire, the string repertoire, all the Vivaldi concertos, Handel, Concerti Grossi, the Dvorak Serenades, Souk Serenade, Elgar. By the time I went to university, I knew the repertoire quite well already. But before I was, uh, got to university, a little incident occurred in my life which changed my life forever. It was in 1976. 1976 was the year of the very big uprising in South Africa, and it started with an opposition to the use of the Afrikaans language as a means of instruction. And the protests soon expanded into something much more general about discontent, about apartheid, about the political situation. And everybody will know that iconic picture of the first victim to be shot dead by the police, Hector Peterson, being carried away by his brother. Now that picture is quite important in my life also, and I will get to that in time. But as the protests spread to South Africa, they also enveloped my school. I was a student at Saltraba High School at the time, which is just a few miles outside the city centre of Cape Town. And I was a member of the student council. In fact, I was chairperson. And school, as we knew it, was suspended by us, and we had a political programme every day. It was our duty to decide what we were going to fill our time with. And on one particular day, we, would, we had been invited to join a protest in a little town called Athlone, our entire school went, marched to Athlone to join this protest. And the police turned up and they fired tear gas and a bit of mayhem. And then suddenly, the student standing next to me was shot dead through the head, right next to me. And I saw the policeman had lifted the gun and shot this student next to me. I was horrified, shocked. It could have been me. And that moment changed me forever. It wasn't just anger that I felt. I felt the desperate need to have to do something. So the following morning back at school, I decided that it was no longer wise for us just to remain inside our school perimeter with our placard saying down with apartheid and justice and democracy, but we needed to do something much more meaningful. So along with my colleagues, I decided that we would march onto what was then Parliament in Cape Town, the Apartheid Parliament. We marched from our school in Saltraba to an annex school, and a few hundred more students joined us. We returned to the main road and marched along the main road into the city. And because the security service were caught on the hop, so to speak, they didn't react to begin with. And as we marched down the main street into Cape Town, all the textile factories along the way, workers down tools and joined us. And by the time we got to the main street, Adley Street in Cape Town, the march had swelled to probably tens of thousands. But it was attacked viciously and brutally from the front with live ammunition, rubber bullets, tear gas, dogs, anything you could imagine. Terrifying. I ran for my life like everybody else. And I escaped, for a while at least, into the general post office. I hid in a telephone kiosk. The tear gas, awful. For anybody that has not experienced tear gas, it is the most awful thing. The harder you rub your eyes, the worse it gets. But I hid in this telephone kiosk, and I don't know, it could have been hours later. I mean, I really thought I was going to die. 
But I looked out the window again at this telephone kiosk and I realized it was quieter than it had been for a while, so I stepped outside. And I tried to make my way home, but fortunately I was rescued. One of the teachers was driving around the outskirts of the city in a VW combi. And they bundled me into this vehicle and drove me back to school. And I somehow made my way home. And it was clear that there would be consequences. My father warned me to expect the knock on the door. Our house was always under surveillance. The, a policeman lived across the road from us. That was to monitor anything that all comings and goings at our home. And sure enough, on the morning of 26th October 1976, at 3 a.m., the knock on the door, a special branch, armed special branch, came to fetch me. They took me off to Kellerden Square, the police headquarters, where I was given a really rough time. But when you're young, you're quite resilient. So I fought back, I bounced off the walls. Whatever they did to me, was I wasn't going to be defeated. And they play all sorts of games with you. I was released, or at least they pretend to release you and rearrest you almost immediately, you get home. And this went on for a while. And eventually I was arrested again and taken to Woodstock Police Station. And this was not so far from the school, Salt River High. And when they eventually took my, my belt, my watch, the money I had in my pocket, my school tie, and slammed the door shut behind me in the cell in Woodstock. I felt a profound sense of loss, disorientation. I had no idea what was going to happen next. And after a while sitting on the floor of this cold cell, I leapt up to the bars at the top and I shouted into the yard and heard another voice. And I recognized the voice. It was a fellow student. He was in the cell next door. But to cut a long story short, we ended up all in the same cell, nine of us. And the charge sheet eventually read, Leon Bosch and nine others. We were not very well treated. I mean, uh, I remember now the cell because we had a reunion in that police cell 40 years after 1976. The youngest prisoner made a documentary about it and we were invited to meet in the cell. And in the corner of the cell was the toilet. And I remember that not only did we all have to use that toilet in public in front of everybody else, we also had to wash from it in the morning. But not only that, we had to drink from it also because they deprived us of food and water. Our legal representative was Dula Omar, who, of course, as you know, became the Minister of Justice in the first Mandela government. And I remember that he arranged for us to receive food from him after days without food. And I also remember how we descended upon that food like hungry vultures. It's painful. But it reminds me what can be done to human beings. In any case, the trial went ahead and we were well defended, of course, by Dula and all found not guilty of all the charges which I think would have resulted in us going to Robben Island as prisoners. But the conditions of our bail were quite strict also. We had to report to the police station twice a day, and this for me meant traveling 11 miles in the morning and in the afternoon, and we had to sign a register to prove we hadn't escaped the country. I also wasn't allowed to return to school, and I wrote my exams, end of year exams, in the police station. But in any case, the trial was over, and I was found not guilty of all charges. But I was very impressed by the performance of our lawyer family friend, Dula Omar. I finished my school uh, career and my ambition was to become a lawyer. I, like Dula, I wanted to defend those who were unable to defend themselves. But the apartheid system required people of color, like me, to have a permit to study at university. I applied for a permit for law, but that was refused. And I thought, just as a joke, I would apply for a permit for music. And I, lo and behold, was granted a permit to study music. And I wasn't going to lose the opportunity to go to university. So I accepted the challenge. And I turned up to the University of Cape Town because I, once I'd been accepted, I had to do an audition. 
At this point, I was a cellist. And I don't think I was that brilliant a cellist, but in any case, I played for, with my audition for the composer, Alan Stevenson, Bach's Ariosa, the famous Ariosa, which we know from the cantata and also from one of the keyboard concertos. But as this audition was unfolding, I realized that it was perhaps a bit of a catastrophe. I wasn't really used to playing with a pianist very much at that time. And I had not been that well taught, really. My first cello teacher didn't play the cello, whereas my second cello teacher did her very best to rectify all these errors. Her name was Edna Elphick, and she'd been a student of Pablo Casals. But I played this audition for Alan Stevenson, the composer, and I walked out of the College of Music with my Suzuki cello in an orange bag, and I thought to myself that that probably was the end of my musical career. But I was very surprised then to receive a letter offering me a place to study at the University of Cape Town. I was delighted, and I turned up, and there I was faced with students who'd had fantastic education. For those of you who know South Africa, you will realize that there are schools like Bishops and Sachs, which are the equivalent of Eton and Harrow in this country, the United Kingdom. Most students had been to schools like that. And a very small full, a handful of students like me, of color, had not had anything like that kind of education. So I faced a choice. I could either give up or I could fight. And I decided that in for a penny, in for a pound, I was going to fight. Here I was, faced with this opportunity of traveling every day from the townships into the plush suburbs. Rosebank, Rondebosch, it's really beautiful. The university, fantastic facilities, marvelous library, great concert halls, fantastic organ in the consulate. There was nothing that white South Africa did not benefit from. It was extraordinary. And here I was in this university. Not welcomed, seen as the imposter, badly treated, despised, ridiculed. They would rather we weren't there. And they made us feel that. There were a small handful of students of color. And on the staff was only one lecturer of color. He was the guitarist, Neve van der Skeef. And more often than not, when things got a little bit too much, I would go to Neve's office or his teaching room, and he would talk to me. He was like a guru. He helped us through those difficult times. But I practiced every day seven days a week. I was in university by seven o'clock in the morning. I didn't leave till 10 at night. I'd been given a great opportunity. The first time I played in performance class, which is where the whole student body assembles in the concert hall to listen to their fellow students play, I performed on the cello, a gavotte by Popper in D major. And I missed a few of the harmonics. And I learned 30 years later that my fellow white students sniggered. But by the time I got to my second year, things had changed. And the thing that made the big difference was this. My cello teacher, Edna Elphick, wise woman that she was, asked me one day to meet with her in the coffee shop at nine o'clock in the morning. And the person that I was to meet turned out to be Zoltan Kovats, the principal double bass player of the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra. He asked me to show, me, show him his, my left hand and just told me that I would have my next, my first bass lesson the following morning. I turned up. I didn't question that. I just turned up. And it wasn't long before I realized that actually the bass and I were really meant for each other. I loved the instrument and my progress was unbelievably rapid because Zoltan was an extraordinarily good teacher. He also didn't care very much for the questions of racism. Of course, there were lots of immigrants from Europe and around the world post-war to South Africa. A lot of them went in order to enjoy the benefits of a white supremacist society. But Zoltan was one of the exceptions who, at least at the level of teaching me, realized that I had some potential and he gave me everything necessary to progress. 
the thing that he also did, which was, I think was very brave of him, was to insist, after a couple of years of study, that I came to play as an extra play in the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra. The orchestra had rehearsed in the City Hall, and of course the City Hall was one of these places where it was illegal for people of colour to go. But there was some arcane little rule which meant that because it was part of my education, I would be allowed into the City Hall to play. So during rehearsals, I'd sit next to my teacher, Zoltan Kovacs, the principal bass player, and for the concert, I'd sit at the back. But it allowed me this wonderful window into the professional musical world at a very early age. I was 17 by then, probably, or 18, 17 or 18. I saw some of the great conductors pass through Cape Town, even though there was a cultural boycott in place. I heard some of the greatest soloists, violinists, guitarists, pianists, cellists, you name it. And I also developed this ability to be able to tell within the first minute of a rehearsal with a soloist or with a conductor whether it's going to be worth listening to. And I'd always advise my fellow students about whether they should spend money going to the concert on the Thursday evening. We had rehearsals Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, concert Thursday and Friday, day off on Saturday and the Sunday concert. And also this provided me with a little bit of money. So I spent all my money buying music. There were two famous publishing houses that specialised in bass music. Well, they, one of them was York Edition in London, run by Rodney Slatvin. And the second was the Doblingham Music House in Vienna. And I would order, by letter, music from these publishing houses. And these parcels would arrive from abroad with foreign postage stamps. And every piece of music I played, I dreamed about the country where it had been composed. And I realized that I wanted to travel to those places physically, but for, not, for then I had to travel using the music. And then something quite fortuitous happened. A violinist from the English Chamber Orchestra in London came to visit South Africa. He was on sabbatical and he came to teach for three months at the University of Cape Town. His name was Paul Boucher. He still lives in London, and many of you might know him. And I mentioned to him that I would love to come to study in London with Rodney Slatford, and he suggested that we should just call Rodney straight away. So we called Rodney, and Rodney told me that if I could make my way to the United Kingdom, he would teach me. And I found this quite an exciting prospect. And it was just about a month before my final exam in Cape Town. I was to play a one-hour recital for the BMAS performance degree. And it so turned out that the external examiner was somebody by the name of Sir John Manuel. And I played the exam, and Sir John came to talk to me afterwards, and he suggested that if, if I ever found myself in the United Kingdom, I might want to go to Manchester. And I didn't really get the whole story properly, why Manchester? But in any case, I thanked him very much for his kind offer. Then I had to find a way to make it to London. I wasn't allowed to travel because I'd been a prisoner in South Africa and prisoners like me, people who were outspoken about apartheid, were not allowed to travel. But I made a friend of a travel agent who told me that I should let him know when I was ready to travel and that he would get me a passport. My exam was in November, I think, and I had a passport during the last week of December. And I left South Africa on a South African Airways flight on the 3rd of January, 1982. And this is crazy, but on that flight was the famous pianist Lamar Krausen. Lamar Krausen taught at the university in Cape Town, and to us students, he was like a god of the keyboard. And I was surprised to find him on this flight. My adventure starting, and of course, to him, travel abroad was routine. And I discovered that he was going to be playing a recital here in the Wigmore Hall with the violinist Nina Bellina. And I promised that I would come to hear the concert. I mean, I, to me, still arriving in England was a big deal. I didn't, I couldn't imagine what it was going to be like. But in any case, my flight landed on the 4th of January, 1982, and here I was in London. I was taken to Rodney Slatford's house in Thornhill Square in Islington, which was going to be my base for a few days till I found my feet. Now, the first thing I did as any aspiring musician would do when I came to London was that I went to a concert at the South Bank Centre. Here I was in England, in London, far away from the racism of South Africa, and I thought that 
this would be completely different. And I was surprised, therefore, to see that the orchestra I went to hear and see had the same complexion as the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra, which I'd played the Thursday night before. It was 99.9% .9 white. And the following evening, I went to the Royal Opera House to hear and see a performance of the Magic Flute. And I peered over the, into the pit, and once again, the complexion of the orchestra was much the same as it had been in Cape Town. And I began to think a little about this. And then I came to Wigmore Hall, my first visit to Wigmore Hall, and I think it would have been in January because it was fairly early on in my time in the United Kingdom. Lama Krasen and Nina Bellina playing here on this very stage a recital. And it so happened that the page turner, for whatever reason, didn't arrive that evening, and I was asked would I turn pages. So I sat and turned pages for Lama Krausen here in 1982. Then, somehow, I found my way to Manchester. Rodney Slatford was professor not only at the Royal College, but also at the Royal Northern College of Music. And he asked me one day whether I would take a day trip with him to Manchester. And I suddenly remembered that this was the place that Sir John Mandel had mentioned. In, in any case, I turned up to Manchester and the head of strings, Eleanor Warren. She had been a cellist and also a student of Casals at some time, and she asked me to play her something, anything. So I, they got a bass out of the cupboard and I played something, and on the spot, she offered me a scholarship. Come and study with us. So 14th of February, Valentine's Day, 1982, I took my suitcase and my raincoat and traveled to Manchester, and that was the start of my career in Manchester. Now, those were good times. The Royal Northern College of Music was a fabulous institution. Lots of music went on and I met so many wonderful people. But also it was important for me because this was the first time in my life that I'd actually slept in a bedroom by myself. This little boy from the townships finally had his own wardrobe, his own bed. Could turn out the light when he felt like it rather than having to consider everybody else in the room. I could do what I wanted. I had a level of freedom which I had never enjoyed. Life had always been a negotiation and had always been at somebody else's term, under somebody else's term, the apartheid regime. You cannot walk over this bridge, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. But here, suddenly, I had a little bit of freedom. But the one thing that never left me was this desperate need to work hard. I think that I probably became a workaholic very early on in life. And I continued this business of practicing for, for as many hours as I possibly could. In Manchester, things were a little relaxed. Students didn't always want to be known to be practicing so terribly hard, so I had to make sure that I practiced at odd hours. When everybody went home from college for the day, that's when I turned up, and I practiced through the night. By the time they turned up after breakfast, that's when I went home. And if I needed need to return for rehearsals, I would, but I did most of my practice in the small hours of the morning. It was quiet, it was peaceful. But I also knew that because I had no money, I had to win competitions and I had to win scholarship auditions. Otherwise, I'd starve. My fees were taken care of, but I needed to live. And for the first time in my life, I had to cook for myself. I had to take care of everything. I bought an iron, ironed my clothes. And I enjoyed it. It was a wonderful period of my life. And then came another cataclysmic event. It was decided that because I'd arrived in the United Kingdom as a student, the best way to stay would be to find a job and then get a work permit, and the rest, everybody thought, would be history. So I was encouraged to audition for jobs. And the very first audition I did was in 1985 for the Scottish National Orchestra. And the principal conductor at the time was Nimi Arvey. I don't know how many people auditioned for their job, but a lot, dozens. I got through the first round, and in the second round, I was the first person to play. Alphabetically, I suppose there's nobody whose name started with A, so I played letter B. And as soon as I finished uh, my first piece, he stepped onto the platform and asked me, do you know this, do you know that? And he asked me, play a bit of Kusevitsky, play a bit of this, play a bit of... And I played everything that he asked me, from memory. And at the end of about half an hour, he said, that's it, I'll give you the job. And he told the panel he was going home. Uh, but they insisted that he should stay, that he had to listen to all the other candidates also. But in any case, I was offered the job. And then we faced the prospect of having to apply for work permit. And it was refused. Leon Britton, 
and Tom King, the Home Secretary at the time, decided that it should be refused on the basis that there should be locally qualified candidates who could do the job, and that I should forthwith be removed from the United Kingdom. It's a shock. I was asked to report at Manchester Airport, presumably to be bundled onto a plane and hurled out of the country. But my lawyer, John Turner, who incidentally is a virtuous recorder player, and Gerald Kaufman, my local MP at the time, intervened on my behalf. And thank goodness for that. Uh, there was then a cabinet reshuffle and Douglas Hurd became Home Secretary. And Douglas Hurd saw some of the letters written on my behalf and he decided that I should be interviewed to find out what my situation was. And it so happened at this time that my father was again in detention. He's being held as a political prisoner. And at Manchester Airport, where I turned up, they also sent somebody to interview me. I'm presuming this person was from the intelligence services because having had some altercation with intelligence services previously, he behaved in exactly this manner and the interrogation took exactly the form that special branch secret police usually do. And on the basis of that interview and their investigations, Douglas Heard decided that I should be granted refugee status. So here I was in the United Kingdom, a refugee. And actually, it is not a wonderful kind of position to be in. It's rather more awkward than anybody imagines. I got a, given a blue passport issued under the protocols for refugees, the Vienna Protocols. And at this time, of course, I was also freelancing with various orchestras to earn a living. And everywhere I traveled, I had trouble. I was arrested at gunpoint in Greece, and they wanted to bundle me back into a plane. I just arrived at the BBC Philharmonic. And everything, everywhere I went, being a refugee was problematic. But in any case, I did what I had to. The job at the Scottish National was no longer available to me because it took so long to resolve my status. But I just played a competition, the Northwest Arts Young Chamber Musicians platform, and I won it. The prize was a series of recitals throughout the, the Northwest and also money for a commission. And the composer I commissioned was John McCabe. He wrote for me a marvelous piece, That's, and that was my first formal commission. But I became principal double bass then of the Camerata because on the panel for the North, Northwest Arts uh, competition was Malcolm Layfield, who also ran the Goldberg Ensemble. And he mentioned to the manager of the Camerata that they just heard this young bass player. Incidentally, I forgot to tell you, and I wanted to tell you, that to begin with, during my career in Manchester, I was often referred to by members of the staff as that little boy from the colonies. And actually, that spoke very loudly. He told me something. But more about that later. But in any case, I was appointed principal double bass at the Manchester Camerata. Sir Charles Groves was music director at the time, and Sir Charles became my champion. He loved the way I played, and he programmed lots of orchestral solos for me, and he conducted concerto performances for me. And he wrote me the most wonderful testimonials every time I needed somebody to speak up on my behalf. He conducted in Liverpool, and he insisted I came along as an extra player, and I had the most unbelievably busy freelance career. Not only was I principal bass in a chamber orchestra, a camerata, I played with every single chamber orchestra in the Northwest, the Northern Chamber, Orchestra of the Mill. I played with the Northern Symphony. I played the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. I got to meet some of the greatest musicians in the world playing with these orchestras. I was a youngster, but I was never afraid to take on any challenge. In fact, shortly after leaving music college, I returned to the Wigmore Hall to play the Trout Quintet with the Brodsky Quartet and Maria Jao Pires. And actually before that, I had an even more extraordinary occurrence. On my, the panel for my final exam, the Royal Northern, was a man in a blue suit by the name of Martin Lovett. And at that time, I didn't know who Martin Lovett was, but it turned out he was, of course, the cellist of the Amadeus Quartet. And after my exam, as I was celebrating in the bar with my friends with a drink, he asked me whether I might be free the following day to come and play with his quartet. Trout. And I told my friends that that man at the bar had asked me to play with his quartet, and they said, do you know who that man is? And I said, Martin Lovett. And there was the next day in London playing with the Amadeus Quartet. But I was willing always to take on challenges. 
and I never let anybody down. If somebody offered me a great musical challenge, I would do whatever was necessary to fulfill their promise, or the promise of, or the confidence they had in me. And the other extraordinary thing which happened very early on also was my, the start of my relationship with the Lindsay String Quartet. Again, it was a question of some fortuitous occurrence. Somebody let them down, and they rang me. They must have tried everybody else by then, but I was lucky to get a telephone, not one telephone call, a few. There were 12 messages on my answer phone asking whether I was free the next day to do a chart. And I was, I went to Sheffield, played with them, and then I played every single concert they ever did with a double bass player for the next 20 years until they retired in 2005, I think it was. And we came here to the Wigmore Hall often. It was a pleasure to work with them. And this was a kind of a glorious time, working as a refugee bass player. I got married, I had young children, and I was probably covering 50,000 miles a year in my car, driving around the country doing concerts. I worked seven days a week. And sometimes I did two concerts a day. I mean, I remember eventually, 11 years later, coming home after six hours rehearsing with the camerata, and then having just enough time to change my clothes and go out to do a concert with the Halle Orchestra. And I was going to be sight reading because they only rang early in the day saying that somebody had gone ill and could I come to play with them that evening. And I put on my tailcoat and I got to the gate. And at that moment, I had this epiphany. I felt that, could I really do this for the next 40 years or however long I had left in my musical career? Always to be sight reading and Mr. Short Notice. And I decided that I had to leave uh, Manchester, and that was the end of my time in Manchester. I had to find something else to do. And somehow fate has an incredible way of making things happen, or whatever you believe possible happens. I remember very clearly, 1995, I was sitting on the grass in the sunshine in the summer during a break with the English Northern Philharmonia. We were rehearsing some music with David Lloyd-Jones for a Naxos recording. And my mobile telephone rang. And on the end of the phone was somebody by the name of Katie Jones. Katie Jones was the fixer of the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. I was surprised to get this telephone call. She asked whether I was free to come to London on the Sunday to do a four-hour recording session of some Rossini opera. The answer was obviously yes. And I had never driven to London before, so I got into my car and I drove to London. I took the circuitous route because I wasn't sure whether I had the competence to read a map and drive through central London at the same time. But in any case, I got to the venue and we did this recording with Sinebo. Fantastic. What an incredible orchestra. I drove home and my phone rang again. Could I come back the next day between six and nine in the evening to do a session recording guitar concertos with Pepe Romero? I was free, so I turned up and I did it. And next thing they offered me a tour. And before long, they offered me membership at the academy. There was I being offered a position with the Academy Smart in the Fields. This had been a dream, a childhood dream. Everybody had heard all the recordings of the academy and here I was, I was being offered membership. It was like a dream come true. Of course I seized the opportunity with both hands. I worked with Sir Neville, with Iona Brown and Ken Slitter, who were the three original mu music directors. We traveled the world. We played with all the greatest musicians in the greatest halls. I've been multiple times to Carnegie, to the Music for in Vienna, to the Bill and Philomene, just about every console anywhere in the world. All I had to do was to turn up and to play well. I internalized the ethos of the academy, the essence of the academy, the music. The academy wasn't just an orchestra. It was a dream. It was Sir Neville's dream. And it was a privilege for me to be able to contribute in my small way to that musical dream. It was an incredible time, but I also realized that the orchestra toured so much I had to do other things in order to stay home a little bit more. I had a young family and I did want to spend some time seeing them growing up. So I found myself another job, 
also alongside this playing as principal double bass of the Mozart players, the London Mozart players. Also, I did a lot of commercial work, so the film business. I probably recorded in my lifetime in excess of seven and a half thousand pop tracks and film scores. But that was quite useful because my earnings from the commercial work subsidized one of my real passions, which was playing the double bass as a solo instrument and making recordings. So I made my first ever solo recording during my time with the Academy in the early 2000s. I played Bottasini. And on that disc, I play the 10 pieces that I played for my final exam in South Africa. That was my ticket to the world, Bottasini. And I, in the meantime, recorded about 14 CDs, but all funded by the proceeds of my commercial work. What a beautiful journey with the Academy. But I realized that it had come to an end, that I needed to step away to go and do something else. I had to find out what it is that I really wanted to do. I'd submerged myself in this wonderful musical world, but it was always somebody else's vision that I was enabling. In the commercial business, it's always the director and then the, music, the composer they engage to do the music, so you're fulfilling always the mission of somebody else. And during Sir Neville's 90th year, 2014, I came to the decision that I had to leave the academy. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that I had to leave just to find out what might happen. We stepped off the plane after a tour in Germany, and I sadly missed Sir Neville at the airport because I had meant to tell him before he went home that I was thinking of leaving the orchestra. So that afternoon, because I didn't feel I could wait any longer, I rang him. And I said, Sir Nabu, I'm ringing to tell you that I will be leaving the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. And he went very silent for at least half a minute. Then he spoke up. And he said, we're very sorry to lose you. It is always nice to have characters like you in the orchestra. Thank you for your contribution. And he says, I realize that there comes a time in the life of every man or woman when they have to go off into the world and do what they believe in. So tell me, what are you going to do? Then it was my opportunity or chance to be completely silent for 30 seconds. I hadn't thought about it clearly enough to be able to give Sir Neville an answer. And after an awkward silence, he spoke up. And he said, I think you should conduct. Why don't you come to my house, whichever day it was, late in the week, and let's talk about it. And of course, I sniggered at myself, thinking, well, a conductor would say to somebody, go and conduct. But I went to St. Neville's, and we chatted for, for over an hour. And it was an extraordinarily generous conversation. He'd got to know me better than I imagined possible during the 20 years I'd been in the orchestra. And he gave me some fabulous advice. And I understood why he felt I should become a conductor. So I went away and went to find a teacher and went to discover the art of conducting. It's now over six years later, and I'm pleased to be able to tell you that I conduct with a level of competence. And also, I understand now that having been inside an orchestra gives you a distinct advantage, especially in the string section, because you speak the language at least of 75% of the orchestra when you understand that sound. And the other things I then realized I needed to do more of were as follows. I'd played chamber music with just about every quartet in the United Kingdom and abroad. I played with some of the most wonderful musicians, some of the greatest pianists. I'd worked with Thomas Vashrif, Peter Frankel, Elizabeth Lianskaya, Mikhail Rudy. I played with everybody else's ensembles, but I had a dream of how I heard the music. And I had, in my earlier life in Manchester, run an ensemble called the Music Group of Manchester, in which Martin Roscoe was the pianist and the string players were my good friends. We played together for 20 years, or 11 years in Manchester. So I started my own ensemble called Imusicanti. And Imusicanti embodies for me this universally cherished 
dream of total artistic freedom. So Imusicante has become the vehicle for my own musical ambitions and for all the things I believe I need to do. So Imusicante plays chamber music, anything from a duo to an orchestral works. So I will conduct Beethoven with Imusicante. I will direct concertos. And that was the, one of the things that Sir Neville told me also about directing my own concerto performances. He asked me who had funded my project with the Academy when I recorded the complete works of Dittersdorf. And I told him that I had raised the money, and he said, well, next time you come and do a project with the Academy, doing concertos, you know them better than anybody else. Why do they need to hire a conductor? Conduct it yourself. Put the bass down, prepare the orchestra, and when you think they sound the way you'd like, pick up the bass and play. I tried that formula. It worked incredibly well. So I now conduct and direct my own performance. So habitually I will conduct the first piece in a program, perform the concerto direct from the bass, and then conduct the final piece in the program. I also continue with my program of commissions. I realized that I played a lot of new music, but I never played any South African music. And I began to investigate and discovered that I didn't play South African music because there wasn't any. So I started a whole project called the South African Double Bass. And I started commissioning, by commissioning one piece from a friend of mine who's a bit of a jazz legend, Paul Hanman in South Africa. Then I got another piece, and then another. I now have in excess of three dozen pieces. And sometimes when one starts a process, it takes on an energy beyond anything you could have imagined. For example, last year I received a telephone call from somebody I'd been in youth orchestra with, Shane Woodbourne. He lives in Salzburg and he also runs the Camerata. He told me that he was thinking of writing a double bass concerto and would I be interested? And I said, of course, I leapt at the opportunity. And he wrote something called Red Ink, a concerto for double bass. And essentially, it is Shane's Woodbourne's way of making sense of apartheid South Africa. He and I grew up on different sides of the divide. He in the privileged part of South Africa, me in the ghettos. Shane, as a child, knew that something was wrong, but he didn't quite know what. He'd also seen the picture of Hector Peterson being carried away dead by his brother. And in Shane's concerto, he uses Nkosi Sikilel e Africa, the South African National Anthem, in the first movement, surreptitiously. In the second movement, more overtly. And in the final movement, in the most unbelievably powerful way. We performed the premiere in the Diabelli Festival last summer, around about this time, and the audience was stunned into silence. It is that incredible piece. And it reminds me, in a way, of the a piece that I commissioned recently from another South African composer called Grant McLachlan. I'd always, in recent times, dreamed about having something based on the South African National Anthem, the new South African National Anthem, for unaccompanied double bass. And I rang Grant one Sunday evening when this idea became so urgent, and I asked him whether he would write something, and by Monday morning I received a piece and I played it, and it's perfect.
Grant, again, grew up on the other side of the divide, privileged South Africa. But he writes for me and I play his music and it raises awkward problems. Now, the problem that it raises is this. Was the settlement in South Africa, the negotiated settlement, a success? I visit South Africa often now, and it's the culmination of a process. In 2003, I realized that I needed to do something about this problem that had haunted me all my life. I'd been to South Africa to play, to perform a concerto with the Johannesburg Symphony Orchestra. And throughout my time in Johannesburg, I couldn't sleep. I suffered terrible nightmares. I remembered prison. I remembered all the brutality. I remembered all the horrible things about the country of my birth, the country that tried to destroy me, the country in which I couldn't possibly have had a career as a musician. I thought of my father, who died prematurely at the age of 56, having spent the last five years of his life underground having got tired of detention and torture. I thought of my mother, who had held the family together. I thought of my neighbors. The family next door had not enough food to eat, but they were always smiling. They always tried to make the very best of everything. When I visit the townships, I go to see my, those of my parents' generation who survive. And I look into their eyes. It's desperate. They've given up. They're waiting to die. And the question is, is this what we fought for? My childhood buddy, Alan Kleinberg, died prematurely at the age of about 56 or 57. Poverty killed him. He never escaped the township. I was lucky. I got away. But I have a responsibility. And the curious thing for me, although it shouldn't have come as a surprise, is that Although I escaped South Africa, the racist paradise, I didn't really escape racism. In the United Kingdom, I faced some extraordinary racism, and I've never really talked about it because I just got on with my life. The first incident that I want to tell you about is so terribly shocking, even now. This happened to me in 1984. I had just auditioned for a professional orchestra to get onto the extra list. And I was successful. And that evening, there was a social gathering at the home or the flat of a musician friend. And I went to this party. And at that party was a fellow professional musician from that orchestra. And I well, didn't detect anything, but I should have realized that it was, this person was particularly hostile towards me because he seized a particular moment, grabbed hold of me, and tried to drown me in a bath of water. He'd run a bath of water and he tried to drown me whilst shrieking racist abuse at me. And for a moment, I was shocked, and I looked in horror at everybody else around me, but nobody came to my assistance for a while. And then the host of the party came into the bathroom, realized what was going on, and she threw out this fellow musician. And at that point, I realized that I was in danger. I was horrified. I was taken aback, and I realized that I needed to protect myself from this kind of thing. So I was very wary about where I went and what I did. I, stuck, I kept myself to myself. I went straight home after work. I never went to the pub. I never socialized I, because I didn't feel that I possibly could. And then the next episode which I want to relate to you is one that comes 20 years after 1984, in the year 2004. I was invited to go to perform in the Swaledo Music Festival, Yorkshire. And I turned up early in advance of rehearsal and I decided to go and eat my lunch in a little beauty spot before going to the guest house where I had the reservation. And when I did finally drive to the guest house where I was going to stay, I was stopped by somebody in a four-wheel driven vehicle and racially abused. 
extraordinarily. I was horrified and shocked. This person expected me to prove why I was in Arkengarth Dale. And I had to get out documents with my reservation for the guest house and also the programs for the concerts. And this person made me believe that I should not be in town. They'd be keeping an eye on me. And he used some of the most vile racist language. I was shocked. And I then spoke to the lady of the guest house, and she then told me, she asked me to describe the vehicle and the person. And she said, well, that's a police officer. And I went that afternoon before rehearsal to the organizers of the festival, and I told them that I probably wasn't happy to stay for the festival, given what had happened to me, and I was wanting to go home. But they persuaded me to stay. And in the end, they didn't make any complaint on my behalf, so I had to do it myself. And the worst thing about it all was that when I made my complaint telephonically initially, they rejected it. They wouldn't take a complaint. This is the police. Wouldn't take a complaint from me about my treatment. And they told me something extraordinary. We don't have problems with eth ethnic minorities here. So I wrote a letter of complaint to the Yorkshire police. Nothing happened for a while, but then I received a telephone call one morning from a chief superintendent who told me that he'd seen my letter and he was horrified. Was I going to be at home the next day? I was, and he said that he was driving to my home in Tring to come and apologize in person on behalf of the Yorkshire police. And he persuaded me not to press charges, but to settle for something called local resolution, which meant that he personally would require these officers to write to me to apologize, and also to go on some sort of training which would potentially allow them to be a little more sensitive when dealing with people like me. And I agreed to it just because he was a very nice human being. And I realize now that I've only twice in my life spoken up about the racism I faced or taken any action. And I realize that I should have gone to the police more often because this kind of thing happens so regularly. And it is not only the vicious things that happen, it's the little things which are seemingly insignificant. For example, every time I turn up to a concert hall with my colleagues, or used to turn up to a concert hall, let's say it's uh, rehearsal's done, everybody goes for dinner, we come back to the hall. Everybody walks to the door without being accosted, and as soon as I turn up, somebody will put their arms out in front of me, excuse me, are you lost? Because they, I couldn't possibly be a musician or anybody related to the musicians that have just walked through the door. When I went to America for the first time, to a convention as a double bass player, I'd been invited by some colleagues to participate in a double bass quartet. And we rehearsed, and into the rehearsal walked some musicians, some esteemed colleagues, and one of them came to me and said, excuse me, are you some sort of jazzer? And I said, no. I'm principal double bass of the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. And he didn't just accept that as a fact. He proceeded to ask me a lot of trick questions because it couldn't possibly be true. So one faces all these things all the time. But I'm very fortunate that I have had a long career and a lot of people know who I am and I, sometimes I don't face some of the horrors that other people face. But I do know that no success has protected me from racism. Even when I return to South Africa, I'm horrified by some of the racism I face. For example, I went to Cape Town to do a master class at the university. And by the end of the master class, my wife had not turned up with, to take me home. So I sat on the steps outside the music college. And a young white South African came up to me and quite brusquely asked me for the keys to room whatever it was. The instant assumption was that I had to be the janitor on account of my color. So one faces problems throughout. And the other thing which reminds me that I have a great responsibility as an artist and as a human being is one of my other roles in my new life post-academy. I'm professor of double bass at Trinity Laban Conservatoire, and also I coach many youth have coached many youth orchestras and on various courses internationally. With students of color, especially in Britain, the question always arises, 
at some point. Mr. Bosch, how do you cope or how did you cope with the racism? And actually, I have a duty to be able to help them with a strategy to deal with that because it's a fact that this happens. When I got home back to Britain, I went to visit my GP, Dr. Anthony Hall Jones, and I explained to him that I'd been a political prisoner at the age of 15 and that I felt that that experience was still undermining everything about my life and that I couldn't solve it somehow. Nothing I tried worked. And he suggested that he was going to look into this and get back to me. And when he did get back to me, he suggested that I go and see a psychologist that he had found by the name of Dr. James Bamber. Dr. James Bamber specialized in union therapy, talking therapy. And I went to Dr. James Bamber for a while, once a week. And we talked and we uncovered a lot of problems, which we tried to resolve through therapy. But I knew it wasn't working. And I, when therapy ended, it wasn't long before the same problems resurfaced. And then I got extraordinarily lucky. I met the psychologist, Dr. Madeleine Clark. And within 30 seconds of meeting her, she said to me, my God, how can you live like this? I was shocked, taken aback. And she said, I, this is the worst case of post-traumatic stress syndrome I have ever seen. You need to do something about this. You cannot go through life with this dead weight on your shoulders. I can't help you with this, but I know somebody who can. And she sent me to Dr. Mark Collins, a psychologist who practices at the Priory in London. I don't know whether he's still at work, but I went to see him regularly for about three months. And he, he is a specialist in a technique called EMDR, Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. It is used on soldiers and it was proven to, it was proven to have long-term benefits and durable outcomes. And it was significant that it was Dr. Mark Collins I went to because he was the son of Canon Collins, who along with Bishop Trevor Huddleston started the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. He understood the finer nuances of what apartheid did to people like me the suffering, the trauma, the imprisonment. He identified so many things and he said that it wasn't only the imprisonment that was the problem, there were so many other issues. One of the biggest issues also was the question of trust in Britain. I thought I'd come to a safe place, but I was still subjected to danger. And he isolated a few incidents which we worked on and I'm pleased to be able to tell everybody that EMDR is like a miracle. It changed my life. My family will be able to testify to that. I'm a very different father and husband to the person I was before EMDR. And I just wish that all my friends, colleagues and family could benefit from the same kind of treatment. It took too long for me to get this treatment, over 30 years. It should have happened as soon as I came out of prison. But it didn't. And the other thing which I felt was particularly useful for me also was a few years ago, I was invited to go and give testimony to something called the Archive of Resistance Testimony. It is run by Emeritus Professor Rod Kedward at the University of Sussex. And they take testimony from survivors of the Holocaust, the French resistance, and apartheid South Africa. And it's a very simple process. You turn up, you sit down in front of the microphones, you say who you are, what happened, and how you feel about it. So my testimony about what happened to me in South Africa is on record in this archive. And that was also part of this process of healing. Just because South Africa, for example, erased from its statutes 
formalized racism does not mean that it's disappeared. The United Kingdom, just because racism is not enshrined in law, does not mean that it does, does not exist. Inasmuch, also, it's a question of class in music. I was lucky that I was quite resilient as a human being, that nobody, nobody was ever going to get me down. Nobody was going to finish me off. I fought back. Whenever anybody told me I couldn't do something, it made me try twice as hard. For me, success, whatever that means, was going to be my revenge. Winning the scholarships, winning the competitions. But every day when I get up, I know I still have a battle on my hands. I wish it weren't that way. I wish I could just live in peace, quietly, but I have to struggle. The therapy was incredibly important, especially with Dr. Collins, the archive resistance testimony, and then all the other things I do. My South African double bass project, buying an apartment in Cape Town and visiting the country. Every time I visit South Africa, we repair another bit of the damage. Just over a year ago, I made the decision, the decision to buy a property in South Africa. Now that might seem curious. Again, the proceeds of my commercial work and working seven days a week for over 38 years made it possible. But it's symbolic in a way also. I do enjoy the sunshine in Cape Town and I do still think of myself as South African born South African, despite the fact that I'm a British citizen, also. But I wanted to be able to be a part of the country in which I was born. The place that rejected me, the place that tried to destroy me, the place that imprisoned me, the place that tortured me, the place that still subjects me to racism, but I wanted to have a part of the soil, my soil. The apartment I bought is at the foot of Table Mountain. These were suburbs in which I was not allowed to go unless I was going to work as the gardener or the servant. The foot of the mountain which I used to see from my bedroom window from the townships. It's my country too. But the thing that's made it all possible is music. Music became a means of resistance for me. It gave me a voice. When I couldn't find the words, the double bass spoke for me. All I had to do was play. Music will always be one of the most important things in my life. It changed so much and still has the power to do much more.